If you've clicked on this, chances are you've already secretly admitted to yourself that you're intrigued by tax havens. Those clandestine financial playgrounds of the ultra-rich where taxation takes a back seat and confidentiality reigns supreme. Forget loopholes. These country-sized secret safe houses are the crown jewels in the treasure map of generational wealth. And in these fiscal utopias, old money doesn't just find a sanctuary, it throws a lavish never-ending party, safe from the taxing grasp of governments, the annoying buzz of creditors and the unpredictable whims of political drama. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll lift the velvet rope and give you a backstage pass to the insane history of tax havens, the ultimate financial soiree, where tax codes are more like suggestions, and bank vaults boast a guest list that would make the Oscars gold would envy. Starting off, let's get one thing clear about tax havens. Contrary to popular belief, they are a relatively modern invention. In fact, in the grand arc of the history of making filthy lucre, they're more like the new kids on the financial block, strutting onto the scene around the turn of the 20th century. Knowing that, you might wonder why they were such late bloomers. Well, you see, income taxes were the party crashes that showed up in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And let's just say they weren't the life of the party for people who, as one reporter said of William Randolph Hearst, build the type of houses God would have built if he had the money. Indeed, before income taxes, your money had nowhere to hide, but also no reason to. But when governments decided to become more, shall we say, involved in people's finances, tax havens popped open like secret hatch doors for the elite, ready to give their cash the escape route it never knew it needed. In the beginning, Switzerland was the trailblazer, the OG godfather of this financial underworld. And why Switzerland? In a word, neutrality. See, unlike countries embroiled in wars or economic woes, Switzerland played it cool, focusing on becoming a fiscal paradise. Taking cues from American states like New Jersey and Delaware, known for their business-friendly local tax regimes, Swiss cantons like Zug dialed down regulations, making them as irresistible as flames to a moth. Specifically, the zenith was a trifecta of tax efficiency, the zurich zug liechtenstein axis, the Avengers of Finance, if you will. Furthermore, the Swiss Banking Act of 1934 elevated this promise to a creed, offering unprecedented confidentiality that turned Swiss banks into the Fort Knox of global capital. And yet, Switzerland wasn't the only bell at the ball. Enter Monaco, the small but sparkling gem on the Riviera. To compete, they had to dazzle. Zero income tax, jaw-dropping marinas, and casinos so extravagant they'd make modern Las Vegas seem like a church bingo night. Indeed, Monaco wasn't just offering a tax haven, it was peddling a lifestyle, a venue where high society and secretive finances danced a graceful pas de deux. Next, the Caribbean jumped in to the Tax Haven Grand Prix. Strategically speaking, with Switzerland offering precision and Monaco offering glam, the Caribbean chose to play the disruptor card. They were the tech startups to Switzerland's established enterprise, shell corporations, asset protection trusts, you name it. Bermuda and the Bahamas were the star pupils in this Caribbean masterclass, learning from both their European and American counterparts, but adding their unique flair. They realized that low taxes alone wouldn't cut it, and so they unrolled a wide range of financial services, swathed in a level of secrecy that could even make a spy novelist pause. They burst onto the scene not just as copycats, but as innovators, and they timed it perfectly stepping into the ring when post-war prosperity left people and corporations searching for exotic destinations to stash their newfound wealth. As the 1960s rolled in, we began a heady era of peace, love, and a Cayman Islands financial landscape that rocked the high seas. What separated this paradise from the Caribbean mainstays like Bermuda and the Bahamas was the banks and trust companies' regulation law. It wasn't just a warm welcome, it was a rallying cry for unbridled financial secrecy. You see, unlike Bermuda, the insurance haven, and the Bahamas with its trust services, the Caymans angled for hedge fund preeminence. Think of it as adding a rare scotch to a bar already filled with fine wines. Fast forward to 2008, and the Caymans had graduated from debutante to diva, solidifying its rank as the world's fourth largest financial center. From fledgling upstart to financial A-lister, it was a star turn that left everyone gawking. And then there's Luxembourg, Europe's underestimated financial virtuoso. P 
picture minimal tax rates and a VAT that practically rolls out the red carpet. But Luxembourg's real secret weapon came in the form of European Union membership. This meant it wasn't merely a sanctuary, it was an EU business express lane. This makes the tiny nation not just a refuge, but a gateway to the entire European market, placing it in a league of its own in the competitive world of tax havens. However, when we're talking global tax havens, the conversation isn't complete without a nod to the East. Europe may have its private indulgences and the Caribbean its paradisiacal lack of oversight, but Asia is where the financial innovation keeps on ticking. Let's start with Hong Kong, that British colonial jewel that evolved into an Asian financial colossus. Thanks to its unique geopolitical status, Hong Kong has the latitude to craft a tax landscape dreams are made of. Picture this. No income or capital gains taxes, all bundled neatly within the secure framework of British legal standards. It's like lounging in a five-star resort that just so happens to have a fortress-grade security system. But what really sets Hong Kong apart is its free port status. It's not just a page in the playbook, it's the entire game plan. In layman's terms, a free port is a duty-free zone where high net worth individuals can store valuable assets like art, antiques and even gold bars without the burden of import taxes or tariffs. So it's not merely about stashing cash, it's about preserving and even growing wealth in a setting that's as tax-friendly as it gets. In Hong Kong's free port, your financial ambitions aren't just achievable, they're practically a given. Speaking of free ports, Singapore is naturally a rising star in the tax haven galaxy that's worthy of your attention. While Hong Kong offers a bustling free port, Singapore's free port access also comes with an added layer of geopolitical stability that's increasingly hard to ignore. Unlike Hong Kong, which has faced its share of political turbulence, Singapore remains a recent beacon of stability. This makes it not just a place to discreetly hold on to your riches, but a fortress where your wealth can grow unencumbered. Now, as the 1980s came in, we entered a decade when neon leg warmers defined fashion trends and secluded financial havens started to feel the pinch of government oversight. Monaco and Switzerland, the aforementioned citadels of banking discretion, found themselves under the scrutinizing gaze of the neighboring European Union. Though they resisted, the inevitable happened. To keep trade with the EU flowing smoothly, Monaco and Switzerland had to abandon their opaque financial practices for greater transparency altering the landscape of offshore financing irrevocably. In parallel, the United States wasn't merely lounging around, it was applying new rules to Caribbean tax shelters. Enacted in 1984, the Caribbean Basin Economic Recovery Act was a dual-pronged approach. It provided tax benefits for companies while simultaneously imposing new obligations for information exchange. A novel chapter in financial clarity had dawned, sanctioned by Uncle Sam himself. And when the 90s came around, controversies and financial blunders started to creep further into the sector. Take, for example, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or BCCI. Headquartered in Luxembourg, BCCI became synonymous with bad practices, including money laundering and drug trafficking, tarnishing the reputation of financial havens. Come 1998, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, better known as the OECD, released a groundbreaking report. It pinpointed 35 tax havens needing serious reforms to evade global blacklisting. This set off an intricate ballet of self-regulation and external pressure in the domain of offshore finance. Furthermore, the new millennium saw Dubai's rise not merely as a low-tax location, but as an unparalleled spectacle. Zero income and capital gains taxes were just the starting points. Dubai also offered an environment brimming with luxury and opportunity. But Dubai's rise as a financial Shangri-La wasn't some fluke. It was a chess move in the Middle East's grand strategy to diversify away from oil dependency. And the UAE's not going it alone. You've got Qatar's Investment Promotion Agency and Bahrain's Economic Development Board also dangling financial carrots to attract global businesses. The region is practically assembling a Manchester City-level lineup of tax-friendly hotspots. But let's now jet set to Puerto Rico, the dark horse in the tax haven Kentucky Derby. Who could have predicted that the Puerto Rico Economic Development Act of 2006 would turn this US territory into a fiscal paradise? Indeed, 
Americans could now find tax nirvana without even needing a passport. It was like having a duty-free shop in your own backyard. And why did Uncle Sam give it the green light? Perhaps as a unique experiment to spur local economies while also providing a domestic answer to overseas tax hoarding. It's like a Buy American campaign, but for tax shelters. And then, cue the dramatic music. The rise of cryptocurrencies transformed Puerto Rico from an intriguing subplot into a central character in the financial narrative. Bitcoin and its digital brethren made old-school havens look like rotary dials next to iPhones. The new wave of influencers, the crypto nouveau riche, are buying up Puerto Rican real estate like kids in a candy store. Names like Logan Paul and child actor turned crypto billionaire Brock Pierce, among others, are leading the parade. Thus, traditional tax shelters are beginning to realize that it's time for a facelift, or risk becoming the eight track tapes of financial planning. And so, here we are, a decade that so far sucked for basically everybody, even the tax havens being put under the microscope, as if they were specimens in a petri dish of international scrutiny. And this shift toward transparency isn't just a buzzword, it's become the North Star of global financial policies, but who are the navigators steering this ship? The OECD and the G20, elite clubs for countries focused on economic collaboration. These organizations aren't just tweaking the rules with their base erosion and profit shifting, or BEPS initiative, they're taking a red pen to the playbook and giving offshore finance a complete makeover. Then enter stage right, CRS and CBCR, the dynamic duo of tax legislation. Far from cryptic boy band names or failed internet startups, these acronyms are game changers. CRS is the conductor of a financial orchestra, coordinating account details across international borders as if it were directing a harmonious symphony of fiscal notes. Meanwhile, CBCR is the Sherlock Holmes of accounting, sifting through financial data like a detective on the hunt for hidden treasure. Thus, the race toward compliance has hit a pace even Usain Bolt would respect. However, every party has its pooper, and COVID-19 certainly fits the bill. The virus crashed the scene like a bull in an economic china shop, turning the once glitzy realm of wealth management into a game of financial survivor. Forget about cruising in a Lamborghini. These days, you want to be behind the wheel of an all-terrain vehicle fitted with airbags and an emergency food stash. And while we're shaking things up, a chorus is rising among Western nations for a global tax. It's like adding a minimum bet to a lifelong poker table of the ultra-rich, ensuring that multinational corporations fork out their fair share, regardless of their glamorous locale. Indeed, it's a disruption that poses a to-be or not-to-be dilemma for many tax havens. So, as we zip through this era of fiscal gymnastics, tax havens find themselves in a high-stakes episode of Who Wants to Stay a Billionaire? Except the lifelines are vanishing and the questions are getting trickier. The narrative is shifting adapt or be sidelined, and how this high-stakes drama plays out, only time will tell. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. What's your true opinion on tax havens? Are they an understandable maneuver by the successful to protect their money from the prying eyes of greedy governments, or are they parasitic hiding places for the elite to not pay their share of society's bargain? We can't wait to hear your thoughtful responses. And as always, thank you for your continued viewership here at Old Money Luxury. Cheers until next time.